Quote, nobody has the right not to be offended. It is pretty clear where Salman Rushdie comes down on the limits of what you can say and when. But free speech, one's notion of free speech, isn't always black and white. Joining us now for more on the black, the white, and the gray of free speech. In Calgary, Alberta, Derek Fromm is a staff lawyer with the Canadian Constitution Foundation. In the nation's capital, Monia Mazik, human rights activist and the author of Mirrors and Mirages. And with us here, back in our studios, Jonathan Kay, Editor-in-Chief at The Walrus, Susan G. Cole, Senior Entertainment Editor with Now Magazine, Margaret Wente, Columnist with The Globe and Mail, and Isabelle bourgeau tassé Blogger with L. Beaver. And you can be part of this conversation. Our producers are hosting a Twitter chat right now, so join in using the hashtag AgendaTVO. As I welcome everybody to the program, I just want to put this little admonition right up front. One of the reasons we are having this discussion is because of the massacre, obviously, in the Paris offices of Charlie Hebdo, and we are going to show one of the cartoons the attackers saw as blasphemous. The reason we're showing this on TVO isn't to make a political point, but simply to show an example of something that angered the attackers significantly. Okay, let's go around on this one. Derek, I'm going to start with you. This past week, Je suis Charlie has become the sort of rallying cry for free speech. Having said that, we've seen other people like David Brooks from the New York Times say, I am not Charlie. And I want to go around our metaphorical table here and find out where each of you is on that. Which are you? Well, my view is that it's very convenient right now to say, I am Charlie, and I would gladly say that. But there are many other times in Canada when people have not stepped up and said the same to protect other people's rights. And it's this situation has made it acute in our minds, but in the day-to-day, -day, we need to say, I am Charlie, more often. Monia Masi, where are you on this? Well, I think uh, this dichotomy is, uh, is very dangerous. I, I'm not Charlie, uh, and I am not against Charlie. So uh, I think we have to nuance everything. Free speech is not an absolute right, um, so we have to be very careful in this debate. So if I can extend the metaphor, sometimes you're Charlie, sometimes you're not. Fair to say? Well, it depends on, uh, on, the, uh, on the story. It depends on the case. If Charlie become a, a, a carte blanche, just a green light for for more uh, surveillance on citizens, for uh, more um, backlash on Muslim and other uh, uh, groups, well, I'm not a Charlie. Okay, understood. Margaret Wente, where are you? Well, we are, um, we are Charlie and we're not Charlie, but I think where we've gotten to in the society is a place where we have become so afraid to offend people sometimes that we've gotten ourselves into a very dangerous corner. We have to get back to a place where um, more people will, I'm afraid, have to be offended because that is really the mark of a truly free society and a liberal democracy. More on that to come, obviously. Susan G. Cole, you come here tonight to be with us representing yourself, not the views of Now Magazine necessarily, so where are you on this? Je ne suis pas Charlie. You're I am not, not Charlie. Okay. I think that we need to find a, a very smart and nuanced balance between speech and our rights to express ourselves and respect uh, for our fellow citizens. And I think I'm so proud to be in this country because I believe we're working really hard to find that balance. And I think our laws, uh, as we look at them closely, will suggest that we, we are in fact doing just that. Jonathan Kay. I am unambiguously in the Je suis Charlie camp. I believe that we should have the right to mock and disrespect uh, any institution in our society, but especially religion, because I think uh, mocking religion is at the heart of free speech. If you look at the free speech cases in Canada, the United States, and other Western countries, this is how the tradition of free speech was forged, where you had secularists and religious dissidents who had enough with oppression from dogmatists, from, in, in our case it was Christianity, uh, but in the Islamic world, obviously it's another religion, but it doesn't matter whether it's Judaism, Christianity, or Islam, you should have the right to mock and dis disrespect the religion all you want. You've just taken over the Walrus magazine. Would you publish the cartoons? Uh, we actually published an image of the cartoon on, on our website uh, last week, and uh, I think it's important that other media outlets do that. Isabel, first of all, welcome to television. Your first ever television appearance, yes? Yes, it is. Good. Thank you for making it here. What's your view on this? 
You know, I've been struggling with this question all week, and to me, it kind of boils down to who is Charlie and what does he stand for beyond the disruption of uh, free expression. Um, I don't have a clear answer to that. Um, I would like to, I mean, if you backed me into a corner, I would probably argue, yes, je suis Charlie, but I am also je suis Ahmed. Um, and I and think that means what? Ahmed. Uh, that is the name of the um, Muslim police officer who, who was, was gunned down uh, outside the offices of Charlie Hebdo. So you identify with that as well? I identify with that as well. I thought that that hashtag actually brought a, uh, brought a good um, counter uh, counterweight to what uh, to the manner in which uh, Je suis Charlie could potentially be co-opted to mean other things down the line. For those of you who are unambiguously for Charlie, I want to read something right now which you may find somewhat disturbing. This is by Anjem Choudhury, a well-known London radical Muslim, and it was published in USA Today uh, the day after the Charlie Hebdo massacre. Here we go. Although Muslims may not agree about the idea of freedom of expression, even non-Muslims who espouse it say it comes with responsibilities. In an increasingly unstable and insecure world, the potential consequences of insulting the Messenger Muhammad are known to Muslims and non-Muslims alike. Muslims consider the honor of the Prophet Muhammad to be dearer to them than that of their parents or even themselves. To defend it is considered to be an obligation upon them. The strict punishment if found guilty of this crime under Sharia, Islamic law, is capital punishment implementable by an Islamic state. This is because the Messenger Muhammad said, whoever insults a prophet, kill him. Peggy Wente, your reaction to that? Okay, well, I think he has just laid out the problem here. There is an irreconcilable gulf between a culture that says blasphemy is a sin and maybe a deadly sin, and a culture that says blasphemy can be a subject for humor, and we put it on Broadway in a show like The Book of Mormons, and it sells out. Those two cultures cannot be reconciled. Cannot be reconciled, and therefore we ought not even to try? No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that we have a real problem. That's for sure. Derek Fromm, how about you on that? Well, I must say I'm generally ignorant whether this man speaks for all of Muslims, and I doubt he does, but I would very strongly disagree with what he said. As the courts in Canada have said repeatedly, Freedom of expression is one of the most fundamentally important concepts to our democracy. It is one of the foundational legal concepts that has led to the formation of all of our political institutions, including the freedom that we enjoy in other areas of life. To abandon it is to abandon all the hard-fought freedoms and liberties that we enjoy. John Kay, having said that, in our, and you're a, you're a lawyer, so I'll ask you this with two of your hats on. The Constitution, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, the American Bill of Rights, freedom of speech, freedom of expression, freedom to practice your religion and freedom, they're all in there. So there's a hierarchy of these things. Some people say the hierarchy not to have their prophet offended is more important than the hierarchy of rights to speak freely. Is that okay? That, well, that's the, the social contract you're describing is the social contract in most Islamic countries, which says that freedom of speech stops when you're insulting uh, Mohammed. Uh, that is not our social contract. And I think what Margaret said was completely correct. There is an incompatibility between our Western uh, liberal social contract, which says that everything is fair game, including and especially religion, and a social contract that says these things are off limits. I believe that when anyone immigrates to our society, they have to accept our social contract. Also, I would dispute what the USA Today writer said about Islam. There is a very interesting op-ed in today's New York Times uh, by a scholar of Islam who points out that nowhere in the Koran does it explicitly call for the death penalty for blasphemers. The idea that you should kill anybody who insults the Prophet Muhammad is essentially a political construct that grew up under Sharia, uh, which is distinct from the actual words of the Koran. So uh, the term he used for it is religious nationalism. And the people who kill in the name of Muhammad should be thought of as essentially extremist religious nationalists uh, who are trying to make a political point about the role of Islam in Western societies. And I think it's our duty to fight back against that. And I don't think, you know, when people say, oh, we have responsibilities to exercise our free speech uh, responsibly, to me that's code word for saying we should censor ourselves about th other things that other people find offensive. And I find that appalling. Uh, if other people find it offensive, I think they should reconcile themselves with Western values, which is that everything is fair game. Monia Mazig, equal time for you on this one. Well, 
I think Charlie Hebdo became uh, not uh, something about free speech. I think the last past years, uh, since uh, particularly after 9-11, they became a vehicle for uh, anti-Islamic uh, feeling uh, growing in, the, in Europe, but uh, also in France. And uh, I, don't ha I don't think it has to do with, uh, with the depiction of the prophet. Uh, many Muslims are beyond this, but it's what comes after the picture. When they have... Uh, a caricature of uh, of naked people you know it they claim that this is funny they find it funny but other people do not find it funny and also there is um, it's like a um, they give themselves the right to uh, criticize uh, Muslim to make them civilized to accept the humor but uh, I think they miss their point because that's open the door on everyone to uh, appear as uh, cultured, liberal, uh, by, um, by attacking Muslim. Muslim in France have no power, zero power. So uh, how can they attack a group of people who are not represented politically, who are not uh, uh, represented in the Assemblée Nationale, uh, who are not represented by journalists, so I think this is like a free humor. Well, yeah, maybe it is funny for some, but if they cannot achieve anything out of that except uh, hitting on the head of Muslim, well, I think they missed their mission. Well, let me follow up with Susan G. Cole. Uh, clearly there is a, a freedom to speak in this country, and clearly there are some mus Muslims who believe that they should have the freedom not to uh, have inflicted on them images that they find incredibly disturbing and against their religion. Whose freedom is more important? Well, I think it's a really interesting question, and we saw it also in the debate about, uh, we're seeing it in this province in the, in the debate about, for example, gay-straight alliances and religious schools. And uh, it's really interesting that you made the point, Jonathan, because I, to a certain extent, I, I, I don't think that we can all necessarily happily coexist. So, for example, I know that um, there, there are some Muslims who don't believe in gay rights. I believe in gay rights. I'm suspecting that the, the courts will you know, decide in my favor as distinct. And I think we will find that as we go through this process, the courts will establish um, law based on what our values are. Okay. And then we well, have to find out what our values are. I'm not sure, though. I'm not sure that you answer the question, which is there are hierarchy of rights here. Yes. The freedom to speak, the freedom not to be offended by images that some people find incredibly I, I, disturbing. I know, which but I'm is taking more important? I'm taking. I, I will take. I, I, I want to deal with your question when you talk about offense, because my uh, whole discussion and discoveries about free speech began in my uh, research on pornography, which I felt was actually having as speech a significant impact on women's status in society. Well, it's hate speech, in your view. It is hate speech, and I would put it in that. But I'm also saying that the idea that every, everybody uh, has equal access to free speech is a really important one. And the previous speaker actually dealt with that when she talked about where Islam stands politically in, in, uh, in France. So how valuable is free speech if the truth of the matter is that the more money you have, the more f speech you can buy, for example? You really have to have access to the speech to make this meaningful for people. So um, I, I guess what I'm saying, uh, Steve, is that, is that offense isn't necessarily what I would be talking about. I would be talking about political power, who how, has it, how it's used. And I've said all along, for example, in speaking about pornography, that pornographers silence women. That's what their speech does, and we have research to prove that. And so what do we do with that in a liberal democracy, allegedly, supposed, you know, where free speech is supposed to be of value to okay, us? Let me get Isabel to weigh in on this issue of these hierarchy of rights and which one you believe should be in ascension. I, I think it's a mistake to look at freedom of expression as a standalone right. I mean, you know, we saw in Paris, we saw the French climb on top of their uh, national monuments, and they were echoing the calls from the French Revolution, liberté, égalité, fraternité. But where has equality been in this debate? Where has fraternity been in this debate? We've sort of singled out free expression on its own without recognizing that the exercise of free expression is one that's often um, steeped in power and privilege. Uh, and, you know, basically the, the exercise of, of, uh, of free expression is an asymmetrical one. 
I suspect all of you know Bill Maher around this table, maybe not personally, Jonathan, but he's all over the tube, he's got his own show, he's a very funny guy, and he is a very provocative guy. Let's play a clip of Bill Maher on the Jimmy Kimmel Show. This was the night of the events in Paris, France. Roll tape. When something like this that happened in Paris today, we have to stop saying, well, we should not insult a great religion. First of all, there are no great religions. They're all stupid and dangerous. <laughs> And we should insult them, and we should be able to insult whatever we want. That is what True. free speech is like. There are certain people in the world who want waivers on free speech. Kim Jong-un in Korea says, you cannot make jokes about our country. Uh, and there's a lot of Muslim people in the world. I, I know most Muslim people would not have carried out an attack like this. True. But here's the important point. Hundreds of millions of them support an attack like this. They applaud an attack like this. What they say is, oh, we don't approve of violence, but you know what? When you make fun of the prophet, all bets are off. There's Bill Maher provoking as he does. Monia, let me go to you first. This clip, it's been all over the Internet, all over television. No doubt has uh, captured a great deal of conversation in the Muslim community. What are, what are you hearing about this? Well, I think Bill Maher uh, represents himself, and uh, he's lucky because he can speak to millions of people. But uh, what he is saying is basically the same thing as uh, I would say, for instance, uh, well, if there are priests who are uh, pedophile, that means hundreds of millions of Christians are supporting them. Or uh, if I say uh, that uh, serial, ki uh, serial ki um, killers are white men, then hundreds of millions of white men support them. This is ridiculous. I mean, it pays off for sure. People find this funny. Um, they find this, uh, he, he will be promoted for sure because uh, this is uh, portrayed as a free speech, liberal, smart, uh, you know, um, anti-religion uh, without being even uh, anti-Islam. So it looks good for a lot of people. Um, I'm not sure that it looks good for people who can have some discernment, uh, who have some nuance in their uh, mind. Uh, and uh, it is dangerous because he has a platform that other people do not have and he can ha he has a sort of immunity that make him a celebrity and uh, he can um, disguise behind hate speech uh, as a uh, liberal as um, by by just saying uh, nonsense Derek let me get you to follow up in this regard uh, clearly he said a couple of things there at least that were disturbing to a lot of people number one that all religions are ridiculous although he got a big round of applause when he said it and the second thing was that while there may be a tiny percentage of Muslims who would act this way, his suggestion was there were tens or hundreds of millions more who would applaud it. What do you think of those comments? Well, I fully support his right to say it. I wouldn't necessarily say it myself, but you know, I think there's a big misunderstanding that we're just moving forward here with, is that freedom of expression and free speech is a right that we hold against the government. It's the natural state that we find ourselves in prior to the existence of the government. What we should be talking about is not what Bill Maher is allowed to do. Instead, it should be, the conversation should be about what limits on his freedom are justified. It is the state that takes away the freedom. So talking about Bill Maher's freedom to insult people who are religious or make factual claims that might actually be wrong, that's not the point. The point is, how powerful should the state be? Can the state be trusted to take away freedom of expression and take just the right amount away from us so that we end up with a better society. I'm very skeptical such a thing is possible and I really do not trust any particular authority to make those decisions for me. I trust my fellow Canadians to decide, not the state. Derek, let me follow up with you because I think you and Bill Maher actually do have something in common. I think you, you both have a bit of a libertarian streak that goes through your uh, political interest. But uh, clearly he is as anti-religion as it comes, and I think, well, you, you help me. Are you, you're an evangelical Christian, is that right? Well, yeah, I, I actually, I grew up on the campus of an uh, evangelical Christian Bible college. So how did and you come to I, your views? Well, I came to my views, actually, by rubbing shoulders with people who disagreed with me. I found myself, much as many Muslims do today, to be of a minority view. And I was involved in the death metal music scene. Now, if any of you know about extreme metal, you know it's anything but friendly to religious folks. 
And so I came across blasphemy in all of its forms constantly all the time. And just because I liked a particular style of music. So I learned to grow a tough skin. And that is the response. I am very uncomfortable with any particular authority telling my peers in the music industry what they're allowed to say and what they're not allowed to say. Because eventually, that freedom that protects them might protect me in what I want to say when there's something important that I need to say. So for me, it's a matter of personal consistency and principle. I will defend people who uh, say things that I disagree with because that same freedom from the state is what protects me in my time of need. John, do you think that the, the rant that Bill Maher went on on the Jimmy Kimmel show there, will that convince the grand swath of Canadians that Islam in general is the problem as opposed to a small minority of clearly twisted people? You know, in a sense, I think Bill Maher has got it wrong a little bit. You know, in the case of the Paris attacks, even Hezbollah, a terrorist group, actually came out against the attacks. You know, it's, it's rare they'll come on this show and, and express agreement with Hassan Nasrallah of Hezbollah, but I was actually shocked. To me, that's a good sign that you've actually got terrorist groups saying, you know what, you guys have gone too far. Uh, so I think there are good signs that there are a lot of Muslims who are saying, look, not in our name, that these attacks have nothing to do with our religion. In respect to what the other stuff Bill Maher said, I mean, God bless Bill Maher, he's a principled leftist. He's in favor of free speech. And when something like this happens, he doesn't emit all kinds of platitudes about equality and, you know, the marketplace of ideas is biased toward white men and all this nonsense. He says these people have the right to say what they said, full stop. You know, he didn't go into any kind of Marxist jargon that circumscribes their right. And that's the way we should approach, approach free speech. And by the way, free speech is a tool for people who are disenfranchised in society to improve their lot. I mean, Charlie Hebdo was a left-wing publication. And by the way, they didn't, contrary to what Manya said, they didn't just lampoon Islam. I mean, one of their most infamous cartoons featured God and Jesus having sex with each other. I mean, this had nothing to do with Islam. They, were, they weren't Islamophobic, they were theophobic. They were against yeah. all religions. Equal opportunity Insulter. Equal, insulters. Yeah, and, and by the way, which is exactly, you know, Bill Maher, Charlie Hebdo, it's all in the same group. I see them as principal leftists. Uh, a lot of what they, they've, they've published, both of them, uh, has been you know, disrespect, disrespectful to religion. But they don't believe in religion. And, and that's their right. So you know, I, I have a lot of respect for Bill Maher. Let's broaden the discussion a bit, because this is clearly not the only example. In fact, we have one on our shores here. Margaret, I'll ask you to get into this here. Dalhousie University, which has been all over the newspapers for the last several weeks. The gentlemen of Dalhousie's dentistry faculty. That was them. They were on Facebook. Fill us in. What did they do? All right, well, they made some pretty offensive remarks about women in general and about some women in their class, and they made some coarse sexual jokes. That's what they did on their private Facebook site. Do you have a problem with that? Well, well, yes, I do, of course. Um, here's the problem, um, and let me, let me make this distinction. I think this is um, not so much a speech issue as it is a conduct issue and how you're supposed to conduct yourself when you belong to any institution. Um, and in that regard, anybody in any institutional context who joked around in like this in such a crude way would be smacked hard by, their, by the authorities. Particularly if you are going to be responsible at some point in the future for the health yeah. of people particularly if we're going to be a responsible professional. What I, what I think this does speak to is how easily today people are offended. That is really the, you know, the, the problem here and what we've seen at Dow. And I, you know, these guys absolutely do need to be disciplined. There's no question about that. Um, but what we've seen at Dow here is a molehill that has rolled into Mount Everest. So you were and not... That's a danger. We, we put up actually one of the slides from the Facebook page. Yeah. You were not offended by that stuff when you read it? Oh, yes, absolutely. You were? Absolutely. But not enough mm -hmm. to kick them out of school? Well, first of all, who knows what they did? We don't know yet. There are 13 men involved in this so-called gentleman's club. We don't know who did what. We didn't, don't know who posted. We don't know who just sat there and read the stuff. Um, so let's, let's little, do a little bit of fact-based investigation, and let's try to uh, you know, have some proportional punishment here, rather than just saying, oh, hang them all high. How well, Isabel, in your view, has Dalhousie handled all of this? I think it's handled it incredibly poorly. I think if you compare it, for example, with the University of Ottawa, uh, when those private messages came out um, with the student council, I think that Alan Rock and Michael Jean did a fine job of coming out early and fast and hard in condemning what they saw, what this they read. Just, just fill in the blanks here. There was a, some 
kind of gross sexual comments about a female student leader. Yes, uh, about a female student leader made by her fellow uh, male student mm -hmm. leaders. In the case of Dalhousie, I think it's been incredibly, it's been poorly handled. Um, and I think, you know, to that effect this morning, um, breaking news is that the police are actually asking women to come forward uh, to tell their stories because the university is refusing to allow the police to have a look at the posts. Um, and that means that, that nobody can really investigate to see what's happening at the moment. What do you think should happen here to these students? The dentistry, the male dentistry students who are responsible for the posts. You know, I wrote about this for Al Beaver, and I, I, I will bring it back to, down to this argument. I think if you threaten to shoot up a school, the police are called. If you cheat on an exam, if you, uh, if you don't appropriately credit a source in a paper, you can be expelled. So why is it that when a student makes a threat, a vile, violent threat against one of his female uh, uh, fellow scholars, why is it that our first instinct is to say, well, they're young, boys will be boys. Women, the women involved don't even want these men expelled. What they want is some kind of due process that will punish them in an appropriate way. But the and is, I, is what I agree that? with That's you on is the administration, the administration has not handled this well at all. Yes, and the women have actually argued that their views are not being adequately represented by the university. So who knows what they're really well, thinking? Well, what has happened now, unfortunately, is that everybody has lawyered up. And mm -hmm. the university is now, you know, all these students have, all the guys have lawyers. And the university now has to worry about a different set of problems, which is the liabilities they could face, and which Ottawa is facing, by the way, Ottawa, which suspended the hockey team, because, um, you know, these guys could claim that their lives have been ruined for no good justifiable reason, and that they don't have due process. So the university has to walk that fine line, make sure that the men have due process as well as the women Can have I due process. Can I just clarify as well? Are the, hockey, yes. uh, are the male hockey players at the University of Ottawa suing? Yes, one they is are. suing. Yes. One is they suing are at the suing moment. Now. Yeah. And of course, not every member of the hockey team was responsible for the Same malfeasance. Thing. Collective punishment, and they're saying, hey, you know, I wasn't there. I wasn't even in the room. Why did you, you know, why did you shut the team down? Susan, well, where are you? This is an institutional problem as far as I'm concerned, because I think what we, what we want to be able to say is that if you were admitted to a particular program, there were certain conducts that you were going to have to, you know, certain behaviors that, you know, you, you, we expect to, to, to see from who you are. And I think we need to understand that these are students who eventually are going to be over their patients in a chair looking in their mouths. It's a very specific kind of thing and I can see why people are reacting so strongly to the idea that dental students have, would be thinking in this way. And, uh, you know, but this is a problem in the College of Surgeons who is, isn't uh, eliminating the, the rapists that are in their midst. You know, this is a, a, a problem among professional, uh, professional uh, in, institutions. And I think that one of the, the things that's problematic here is that, um, and it's interesting in the context of a discussion of freedom, because I know we all, you know, that the same people who argue for freedom of speech would say we have to have academic freedom. Mm -hmm. But that has been supplanted, I think, in a good way in universities by the, by, by the administration saying our priority is to create situations in which people can learn in a safe environment. And that you can't learn if you think that there are people sitting beside you who are fantasizing drugging you and raping you. It's a, you know, it's, it's, it's a situation like that. And I find it interesting that we're able to see, for example, Margaret, that you would say that you're appalled or, or you know, that this is a free, it could be argued that it's a freedom of speech matter. But in fact, I would say again in this instance that, you know, no, these aren't even undergraduates here. These are graduate students. These are adult men. Old enough men, to know better. Old is what enough you're to saying. know better, and yeah. not boys being boys, and now they're men. Let me follow up with John on this. This clearly is not the case of Charlie Hebdo, where we're talking about people being murdered, but it is clearly the case of some people going over where some people's line is for what's appropriate behavior. It's not something they so much did as wrote. What kind of sanctions do you think? I don't think there should be any sanctions. Uh, my view is that what was said on this Facebook group is exactly the same kind of misogynistic, sexist idiocy that I heard a hundred times over when I was in college and in law school. The only difference is now you have social media, so it's been recorded. But I heard variations of this, I mean, among guys trying to outdo each other in terms of macho banter uh, and trying to, you know, prove how macho they were and say, oh, I do this to this girl and that to the girl. I mean, this is what idiot guys do when they're in their teens or their twenties. And thank God social media didn't exist when I was in college because my friends, you know, I had friends who were in fraternities. Uh, you know, thir any 30 second clip from any frat party I was at at McGill 
in the 1980s, and all those guys, their careers would have been ruined. Uh, and guess what? These, these men grew up to be sort of humane, decent people who, it turns out, back when they were younger, said stupid things because that's what guys do. Uh, and they don't turn into rapists. They don't turn into rapists. I think these people should be shunned according to people's social preferences. I think perhaps they should be outed. Uh, they should get the social stigma that people who say stupid things and are recorded get in life. But not charged with anything. Of course not. Margaret, you agree? There is no legal, no, no, there, there's no crime here. There is no crime. There, um, there is a, a violation of the social contract, to be sure, absolutely. And, uh, you know, we can treat that in a whole number of ways. There's certainly a, certainly a violation of the student code of conduct, I have no doubt about that. And, um, you know, the, and, and the university is going to acknowledge that, has acknowledged that already. Can but I a crime? No, it's ridiculous. One sure. more thing. I think after the show, everybody should go online, Google Margaret Wente's name, read her column on it, because she wrote the column that I didn't have the guts to write because I'm a man. There's also a great columnist named Barbara Kay, who's written about this subject. What do you know about Any her? relation? Uh, <laughs> I used to edit her at the National Post. <laughs> the point is, guys aren't allowed to write columns about this. Uh, you know, I think it's, it's principled uh, free speech proponents among female journalists who have written the best columns on this, because a lot of male journalists, uh, we've been cowed by it. I guess our free speech rights have been taken away. Oh, because, well, yeah, you go you know, too far, yeah. George, <laughs> by saying that simply because you feel you have a problem with having to state a case like that because you're a male, that you haven't got freedom of speech. I, I'm joking. I, Good. I, I, I have the freedom, but I would have suffered the, so, the social stigma for But aren't it. you saying what about freedom of but, speech, but that if you, know you speak, what? that's what you have to it's take? True, but that's, that's take fair. the heat, It's right? fair, yeah, but I wasn't courageous enough to take the heat. I let uh, Margaret take it. And she did. And she did. Monia, let me go to you on this. The University of Ottawa situation, the Dalhousie University situation, how do you think these ought to be resolved? It is surprising because a due process should be for everyone. Nevertheless, when there is cases of uh, most of the time male student, and I have to say white male student, when they are in trouble, this is when we, we really uh, champion uh, the due process. I would wonder what would happen if those same students are from a different religion, uh, maybe a Muslim, or from a different race, maybe black. Uh, I think the due process notion is not going to be so much, um, you know, put in the front and uh, championed. Uh, I have my reservation. Personally, I think um, this case in Dalhousie or in Ottawa U shows very well again this balance of power linked to the power of speech. Um, if, if we have, if we come from a privileged background, then uh, we have the right, you know, it's silly, it's not that misogynist, you know, to say those degrading comments about women. Nevertheless, if you are from an oppressed or uh, um, maybe not very socially uh, high social class uh, or maybe an immigrant, then you, your background is going to be judged more than what you have said. Uh, we shouldn't forget that there are people who are now in prison for what they said on Facebook because of um, their support, for example, to violence. Why can't we say that a due process should take place there as well? Uh, there is, just of today, a big humorist in France. Not everybody likes his humor, though. His name is Diodonné, and he is arrested. He's being interrogated because he just said, I am Charlie Koulibaly, so hinting that he is with the with the guy who committed uh, the um, killing and shooting. So I think here we have to be very careful. I mean, freedom for speech, right. You know, I am fine with that. But our society, how it practices today, it has double weight and double measures. Um, the the student at Dalhousie, to go back to the example, I have no doubt in my mind they should be treated fairly. But also, you know, they, there should be consequences. Okay, we let me... We shouldn't give them reasons. Let me try this, because, uh, Margaret, I'll go to you on this one. If you're... If it's a wonderful thing to say, I am Charlie, and I believe in free speech, damn the torpedoes, is it also okay to say, I am, and then use the name of one of those killers and defend their right to say, I'm in favor of storming a, 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 a magazine and killing all the yeah, people you know, who insult Monia, them. She's raised a really good point here. Um, it's very 
easy for Western liberals to say, oh yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm Charlie and I'm, I'm for free speech and all of that. But what do you do, you know, there are always the hard cases. What do you do about a man named Diodonné, who is a, a French um, comedian, he, he builds himself as a comedian, he has a wide following young, among young, young Muslims. Um, he preaches that uh, there's a Jewish conspiracy and there is an Israel conspiracy. He's mm -hmm. extremely anti-Semitic. What do you do about him? Do you shut him down or not? You know, I'm conflicted about that because to me, what, he really is preaching hate speech. And so where do we draw the line in a society that says, you know, we really should tolerate almost everything? Let me go to I'm Derek on that one. Der Derek, what do you, what's your view on that, whether or not if you identify with the killers, is that okay to do as well? Well, I, I think that's a two-part question. Is that okay? Socially, probably not wise. You're going to bear the heat, as Jonathan has said. But in terms of what the state, what France as an institution itself should be able to do to silence you, I'm very skeptical. Because again, France itself, somebody has to make a decision what is acceptable speech and what is not. There's no one is going to be happy across the, where, wherever that divide is. There's not, not one society anywhere in the globe that will, you know, everyone will come to the same opinion where that line should be drawn. So should he be able to say it? Yeah. Okay. But should he have to bear the social consequences? Yes. And there might be significant consequences for saying that. But not official charges in your view? Not official charges. Okay. Susan? Well, it's interesting because um, in Germany now, uh, if you declare yourself a Nazi, you're, you're not only in trouble, but I do, do not believe you're allowed to congregate, you're not allowed to demonstrate. Against the law. Well, because they've seen the historical consequences of certain kinds of hate speech. That's why when I wrote a column about this issue, I m mentioned offhand Joseph Goebbels, who was a really good propagandist and very successful, and we have the gas chambers to prove it. And I think it's a really interesting historical example of what speech can do. And, uh, and, and to me, as Germany tries to uh, you know, salvage uh, its legacies and, and reconstitute itself and is, is actually being successful. I actually support, they, they've made that choice within their own country to do, to to never to have it again, and never to have it happen. Free speech to, rights. To, to take it. And, and okay. so I'm, I'm addressing your point, Margaret, that it is a tricky thing. And in some mm -hmm. cultures, they've actually just said, mm, we've been here, we've seen this, we're going to do it this way. But Isabel, if it's okay to say, I am Charlie. I sympathize, empathize, identify with people who are making offensive cartoons against the Prophet Muhammad. Is it also okay to say, I identify with the guys with the guns who came in and shot them all to death? You know, it's interesting. I never thought of that I would actually be agreeing with Margaret Wente, um, <laughs> but I, I find that I'm uh, on the same page as you at the moment. I think that this is where the idea of the double discourse comes into play, right? I think, you know, just on Sunday we saw uh, politicians from across Europe and the, across the Middle East come together and march arm in arm to protect freedom of expression, and yet, you know, two days later, we find ourselves in this awkward situation. I think Zudonet is reprehensible. I think he's He's vile, um, but, but you again, defend I defend his right to say what he wants to say. I sadly have to defend the right of his right to free expression. Okay, let's. Uh, we've been talking about universities. We've been talking about free speech. It is ironic that in this day and age, university campuses seem to be one of the one of the places in our world where you don't find a lot of free speech. And I want to, Jonathan, I'll go to you first. I'll make a little list here. You probably remember this: Ann Coulter speech at the University of Ottawa. Lots of protests. They canceled it. That was five years ago. Uh, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, scheduled to speak at Concordia University, caused a riot, big problems. Christine Lagarde, head of the IMF, Smith College in the United States, they had to cancel her uh, um, convocation speech because people were upset about that. Condoleezza Rice, former Secretary of State of the United States, Rutgers had to withdraw an invitation to her. Ian Hersey Alley at Brandeis University. Apparently a lot of people had a problem with her speaking there. What's going on on our campuses these days? What I think is going on is that militant identity politics have, have replaced religion as the binding force among young people. Uh, so I certainly remember this from my college days uh, when political correctness was, was in its heyday, uh, that you had people who identified with nationalist movements or with ethnic movements um, who, I mean, that was their binding faith. And as with religious zealots, people who are zealots for identity politics, uh, they will censor in the name of their chosen 
ideology, because to them it's the revealed truth. If you're a militant feminist, or if you're militant Afrocentrist, or you're a militant Orthodox Jew, or uh, an Islamist, that is your revealed truth. And anybody who comes on campus to challenge that revealed truth is a sort of heretic. Uh, so that's what happens in secular societies. You reject religion, but instead, especially among young people who kind of get brainwashed and this stuff, uh, they, they become censors, ironically, in the very place where people should be most open to new ideas. Thank you. What I find most disturbing, disturbing about this trend, very real, is that university administrations themselves have stood aside and not asserted speech rights, freedom of expression, the very places where expression ought to be most free. And not only that, many of the faculty are weighing in against free expression. Why do they do that? Because they're asserting identity rights. Uh, in the hierarchy of rights, those come first. You know, I think there should be a, a, somebody made a great suggestion, there should be a trigger warning on the front of every university um, uh, course catalog saying, um, warning, anybody who comes here may be subjected to offensive speech, um, conversation, books, research, you name it, um, to homophobia, xenophobia, um, racism, discrimination, it's called education. I know, but really, I, I, I think that what I notice going on is that, is that people are confusing uh, having, for example, an editorial policy as censorship. I don't think that when a newspaper has an editorial policy and says, uh, we are not going to publish these cartoons because they violate our, our editorial standards, that that's censorship. Censorship it happens when the state tells you what you can and cannot say. I don't even think that on a campus I would call it censorship because it's simply not true that everybody with every idea has a professorship or can teach. Uh, in the case of Ann Coulter, she got to speak. She didn't, and she spoke outside of the university. And I didn't, I personally did not have a problem with that. Uh, it's simply not the case that every single person who has an opinion is invited to the university. So when the university makes a choice as to who they're going to, she had been invited to the university. No, I, I'm saying. Uh, Hear, hear me out. I'm saying that when that yes, the university made a choice as to who they were gonna they were going to have speak at the university, but you know it, it's not like everybody gets to speak. So if if, if the per, the choice is made and somebody says uh, I I'm. I, I know in the case of Ann Coulter, there was a huge response, so and she did get to speak. She just didn't get to but speak on the campus. But the mob gets to veto where she gets to speak. It's not, it, well, it's not necessarily it was the mob. mob. It was literally not, a mob. It, it wasn't a mob. There was a demonstration where she spoke of, but finally, but there wasn't a mob. There was a huge reaction to the fact that a right-wing person with no academic credentials who was from America was coming to, an Ameri to a Canadian published university author. to speak. Published and, author. Published author. So published author, so published so author so who's, no, who's more not, famous than anybody in this room. We're not too but I think but she's a clown. Not, that's not By the way, I don't, I, have, I, I don't have much time for Ann Coulter. I actually think she's a clown. Of course. However, uh, if she's invited to speak at a university, the mob doesn't get to decide, you know what, she offends me. She doesn't get to speak. She has to go speak at the Holiday Inn or something like that. I think that's appalling, and I think it's weird that you would defend that because to me that's mob rule on campus. Well, let me jump in here with this because it has raised the issue of outrage, and there appears to be a great deal of outrage about a lot of things in our society today. And Slate Magazine had a, I don't know how many of you saw this, a pretty clever feature at the end of 2014 called The Year of Outrage. And let me read a little excerpt from this. This is Julia Turner writing, over the past decade or so, outrage has become the default mode for politicians, pundits, critics, and with the rise of social media, the rest of us. When something outrageous happens, when a posh London block installs anti-homeless spikes, or when Khloe Kardashian wears a Native American headdress, or for that matter, when we read the horrifying details in the Senate's torture report, it's easy to anticipate the cycle that follows. Anger, sarcasm, recrimination, piling on. Defenses and counterattacks, Anger at the anger, disdain for the outrage, sometimes an apology, and on to the next. And the same cycle occurs regardless of the gravity of the offense, which can make each outrage feel forgettable, replaceable. The bottomlessness of our rage has a numbing effect. So says Julia Turner in Slate Magazine. And we were not uh, immune from this. You know anything about this, Isabel? <laughs> we, know, we were not immune from all of this business. Uh, I forget the date. Was it March something or other? What date was it, Sin? March 16th. If you go onto this big thing and you click on March 16th, uh, here we go. Every day of the calendar represents a day of outrage. And if you click on March 16th, uh, there was a hashtag, women only excuses for Pakin. 
And this was, for those of you who don't remember, uh, something I wrote not particularly elegantly about trying to get more women to come on the program and why we were having difficulty doing so. Okay. Slate seems to suggest, Isabel, go to you first on this, that we have lost a sense of what the appropriate reaction to offense should be. What do you say on that? Well, you know, I have to quote uh, Rick Mercer on this one. I think rage is my cardio as well. Um, you know, I think for El Beaver, we kind of, to a certain extent, relish in the idea of outrage. Um, but we also kind of tend to use it in a, in a humorous way. And of course, I wrote about uh, the reaction to women on only excuses for Pagan. Um, It's okay. <laughs> I mean, you were trying to make a point. We were making, yeah. yes, I was trying to make a point. Um, it, but, you know, I, I never thought for a second, you know, I, with your producers, I, I talked a little bit about self-censorship, and, and I gave a lot of thought as to whether or not I would censor myself before I wrote this piece, and would I write it with a pen name. And in the end, I decided to go with my own name and to give free range to my ideas. Um, and I think that, you know, it was, it was because I was convinced that you were able to take it. I thought that you would probably be able to engage in that kind of, you know, perhaps beyond the snarkiness of my post, but you would be able to kind of engage in the substance of it. Well, as they say, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. You are here. <laughs> so obviously what you had to say was uh, interesting and no one held it against you. Uh, okay, Derek, how about you on this? Uh, why? The, the, the need to be outraged, the, um, the freedom to be outraged, uh, seems to have overwhelmed uh, so much else in society today. How come? That's a very good question. Maybe we're, maybe we're adrenaline junkies, I'm not sure. But you know, I do, I do know that we've done a really terrible job of educating ourselves about what the importance of freedom of expression and free speech is. And so maybe it's an inappropriate reaction because we're not exposed to it and we're not thoughtful of it. There's nothing that irritates me more is when I hear one of my friends, colleagues say, well, there's no such thing as Canadian culture. There's no such thing. And I always look back at the institutions that we've inherited, like a free press, freedom of expression, freedom of religion, liberty. These are important institutions that are part of Canadian society. And we've done a terrible job of educating our people, our children, about what this means. Now, both in terms of rights and responsibilities, and Jonathan alluded to this before, about what responsibilities mean. I view responsibilities in the contents of freedom of expression as being, you have the responsibility to stand behind what you say and to bear the consequences yourself. That is your responsibility. You can't offload that on somebody else. So why are we so outraged all the time? Perhaps because we're in an environment where all of our speech is so controlled. Hmm. Peggy, you're an outrage factory. I, I, I think like you, you see, I, I, I don't know this, I'm guessing, I think you see it as your job to be so provocative in your column as to, as to just generate as much outrage as you can and let the chips fall where they may. I'd love to read your emails. What do you get, what do you get back from people when you write a real humdinger? Um, I, I get a lot of support, if I'm lucky, and um, you know, the rest of it you can read on the, in the comments section. Um, but I think social media is one reason why the outrage has become so amplified because everybody now has an outlet. And um, we thought that social media would be nothing, do nothing but good in promoting wider civil discourse and more people taking part in the conversation which would become elevated. Um, but instead it's gone the other way. There's something about social media that tends to drive the discourse to the bottom. Hmm. And um, uh, you know, I think we're, we're really all grappling with how come and why this is. But it does tend to bring out the worst in people and it tends, does tend to bring out the outrage gene for sure. Everybody has a platform. You can say whatever you want. The rules of engagement, both legal and otherwise, uh, have not been set regarding uh, the web. So in fact, whereas some people think, oh, our free speech is being limited, I think it's freer than ever myself. Monia, let me, let me get you to weigh in on whether we are experiencing too much outrage about too many things, too unnecessarily. What's your view? Well, I would like first to comment on, um, on one thing that was said about the universities. Um, I think we are missing a very important aspect of the discussion here. Uh, finance. It is important to remember that a lot of the outrage uh, or lack of outrage um, is being somehow uh, explained or uh, by finances. 
um, like number of copies of uh, Charlie Hebdo that were uh, sold today, three million. Um, so whether we are, we like it or not, whether we are with Charlie or against Charlie, um, there will be a lot of money uh, coming into the uh, Charlie Hebdo. Um, now also for universities as well. There is a, uh, when, when, when a university decide to invite a speaker or to uh, deny a speaker to speak beyond the principles of free speech and uh, of uh, liberty of expression, I think there is also a concern about money. The university right now are, uh, a lot of them, they, they, they really need money. They need the uh, financial uh, funds, and uh, for sometimes it's not always, you know, these high principles of uh, uh, that they used to represent as places of discussion. And the same play, and the same case apply to journals. A lot of them are really in very bad shape financially. Uh, we are not sure whether the newspaper, as it is today, will continue. So I think. Uh, outrage or freedom of expression or uh, you know the controversy or the viral like YouTube they are also uh, means to make a lot of money out of there and we should remember this this is not free this is not uh, something uh, that we do it just for the sake of uh, of our uh, rights or our uh, country or our freedom money speaks here indeed John you want outrage Look, I, I, first of all, I'm not quite sure why Manya was talking about the three million copies that Charlie Hebdo is selling as an example of sort of financial corruption in the media. They, nine people died at that publication. That's why people are going to buy the publication. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of why people are outraged, um, I agree with what Margaret was saying in terms of, you know, there's something in the air in terms of social media. I know exactly what it is. It's the hit counter. You write something that generates outrage or that promotes outrage, you're going to be retweeted 50 times as opposed to five times. And that's the coin of the realm these days. Well, at the National Post, one of my jobs was to monitor the hit counter and see what kind of subjects people are interested in. Uh, inevitably, the sort of subjects that people are interested in reading about are the sort of things that stoke tribalistic fervor. It could be political tribalism, it could be uh, religious tribalism, ethnic tribalism, um, but at the end of the day, people like a good fight. And outrage is a way for mobs to organize, either on Twitter or in the mass media, on their side of a culture war. And as wonderful as the social media is, as wonderful as blogs are, unfortunately, for all the other good things they do, they are also are mobilization t tools in some of the ugliest cultural battles that are taking place. Derek, let me follow up with you and, and get some better sense then about what we can and cannot say in public if we don't want to face legal consequences. Can you help us on that? Well, sure. Uh, particular to this context, I think it's important to talk about Canada's blasphemy law. Our criminal code, section 296, actually contains a prohibition on publishing blasphemous libel. Now, uh, that, the, that provision of the criminal code has not been used uh, since 1935, so potentially it's fallen into disuse and won't be used again. But at that time, and conceivably now, what it means is that you're not allowed to publish uh, content that vilifies or chastises people for their religious beliefs. In 1935, the context was that it was particular to Christianity, but that case arguably expanded it because that case, Rahard, what it said was that the purpose behind the blas blasphemy prohibition was to protect the king's peace. So you could think of all sorts of things that you could publish, whether they be cartoons or something on Facebook, that would incite people and disturb the king's peace, you could be liable for two years imprisonment for publishing blasphemous libel. Hmm. And still today? And still today. Yeah, it, it's effectively dead, but that doesn't mean it's truly dead. There's been numerous court decisions in the last 20 years, Supreme Court decisions, which reference this portion of the criminal code as a potentially justified uh, limitation on freedom of expression. So it has not been tested. But it was in the UK. In 1979, there was a gay men's publication that had a poem about Jesus having gay sex. And so someone named Mary Whitehouse was so offended at this that she did what was called a private prosecution. And even though this was a criminal code offense in the UK, the private prosecution allowed her to take over the role of the crown and become the prosecutor. She won her case. Hmm. Now, 
the, the, the person who was convicted or the publication that was convicted did not have to serve any jail time. But uh, in the end, she won the case through a private prosecution. And then 2008, the UK has since gotten rid of its blasphemy prohibition. So it could still happen here. It is possible. Interesting. Just a couple of minutes to go. Let me put one more thing on the table. And Margaret, I want to come back to something you said earlier, which is, I think we're in trouble. That's what you said. Can Canada's liberal democracy have free expression and coexist with our commitment to diversity and tolerance and all those other good things? I think we can, yes. And I we think meaning who? We, I think Canada can. I think Canada is in, especially, in an especially lucky and privileged position in the world. Um, I see really very, very little problem to no problem here. Um, we also have a high level of um, public trust and respect. Um, example, hardly anyone published the Muhammad cartoons, which is one indication. Um, maybe we should argue they should, but um, there's a big social consensus around here in, in this country about uh, respect and understanding. Peace order Not and so good much. Government. That's that's Canada. Mm -hmm. That's us. That's great. America too is pretty safe. Um, parts of Europe, not so much. Not so I think much. there are some big problems there. Isabel, how would you answer that? I think we're doing okay. I think we could do a better job. Um, I think we need to do a better job of understanding, um, and I know that Jonathan will probably hate <laughs> what I'm about to say, but I think that again, you know, uh, freedom of expression is sacrosanct, but it comes with responsibilities, not only to stand behind what you publish or what you say, but to also understand that it has an impact on people around you. Um, and I think that this is where this idea of privilege comes into play. I think we have to understand that we around this table are in positions of privilege hmm. and not everybody is and not everybody has the same access or the same ability to exercise their own freedom of expression. We need to just keep that in mind. John, you're obviously not for peace, order and good government. Look, I think Canada is actually in a much better position than most countries. I agree with, with Margaret. Uh, one of the great things about Canada is most of our immigrants are fairly well educated. Uh, our Muslim and uh, Arab uh, population are extremely well educated uh, compared to the immigrant class in European countries. We have a very moderate Muslim population here in Canada. It's one of the reasons that when you hear of lone wolf terrorists in Canada, often they're recent converts. Uh, they're people like Michael Zihaf Bibo, uh, who didn't really seem to know anything about Islam. Uh, so I'm actually very optimistic about Canada. Uh, I think uh, we're much better off than they are in, in France. We're actually going to give the new editor of The Walrus the last word on this program because we're just so delighted you joined us today. Is that thank okay? You. Thanks very much. Okay, excellent. Derek Fromm and Monia Mazig, we thank you for being there on the line for us in Points Beyond. We appreciate your participation in tonight's discussion. Jonathan Kay, Margaret Wente, Susan G. Cole, Isabel Bourgeau Tassé. What a lovely name. It really beautiful. Uh, thank you all for joining us on TVO tonight as well. Thank you. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.